Your sensors are correct. Do not adjust your heading. Your heading. You've discovered the Omega Particle. Streaming to the Alpha Quadrant and beyond. 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 Here's your host. The Anchorman of the Federation. The Doctor of Dilithium. This is Jonathan Wiegand. Welcome to... The Mega Particle Podcast. I am your gracious and humble host, like the man said, Jonathan Wiegand here, sitting behind the golden OPP microphone. We are back at it again with what I like to call Where Are They Now or Where in the World Are They series. And this will be a hopefully not a controversial episode. Um, it will probably be a um, heart-wrenching episode is a very intense episode, so just putting that out there now. Warning, this does deal with mental health issues and addiction, so just preference that right now, get it out in the open. But I, w- I was just watching, you know, going through my personal <laughs> Star Trek rewatch, as we all do, as we all have on our on our plate, and it got to the point of the end of Season 3 going to Season 4 of Voyager, and I was like... Whatever happened to Jennifer Lins, who plays, you know, Voyager, and, or, I'm sorry, who plays on Voyager, and she plays Kess, the uh, Ocampa, and I was like, whatever happened to this this girl? I, I think, you know, she doesn't really do conventions that I know of, and she doesn't really do any real social media, so I was like, what what's going on? And I, I loved researching uh, stuff about Avery Brooks, who plays Captain Sisko, and learning about his life, and his music career, and how he... He became a professor at Rutgers University, and I was like, okay, this will definitely be cool, and it didn't turn out that way in the slightest. It was actually um, kind of a tragic tale, but I I, I debated with the teams, like, should we do this, and um, I think it's best that we do. I think it's uh, still good information. I think it's it's good. Uh, I think people can always turn around and change, so we're going to we're going to talk about it, so I'm excited, and it's going to be pumped. I am thrilled to be back behind the microphone. We went through holidays, took a couple weeks off, and and then the research into this episode took most of the time. So you're kind of wondering, well, what's been about three weeks since the last episode? And it's like, well, we, we actually tried to, to reach out to Jennifer Lynn's, uh once or two times, and um, the team kind of decided against it because... Uh, she lives in an area of the country that I'm very familiar with and have friends in, and I went to school in that area, so our college in that area, so I was like, okay, this could definitely be cool. Before we get into the episode, I want to say we will be continuing our uh, DS9 rewatch series, so be on the lookout for that. And just to kind of give a recap, we're going to be kind of going through Jennifer Lynn's backstory, her days on Voyager. There's a lot of theories and controversy over you know, her firing and then, and then obviously her life after Voyager and, and what becomes of her. So buckle up everybody. It's going to be a great episode. And Luna, let's hit that beautiful bean footage. So Jennifer Lynn left Star Trek Voyager, you know, after three seasons, she was playing cast. And Kess was a very central and interesting character on the show. Uh, The show premiered in 1995, and it kind of ushered in this whole new generation of Star Trek fans after TNG came to an end. And it's if you've never watched Voyager, just a quick recap. It's it's a very unique Star Trek show, unlike any other. Um, So we have Captain Janeway's starship, USS Voyager, found itself lost in the Delta Quadrant. So you have Alpha, Beta Quadrant, and it's thrown into the Delta Quadrant and embarked on this 70-year voyage home. And as Kess, you know, she was a series regular. She appeared pretty much almost every episode, um, it seemed like, in the first couple seasons. But she was very fascinating because they actually started using her telepathy, and she only had a, a lifespan of nine years. So they had a very big opportunity in the series to kind of explore that but unfortunately it didn't come to fruition only after three years on the show uh, Lynn left the series and it was a big loss for people behind the scenes and we'll go like I mentioned before we will be going into the theories and the controversies behind her firing 
and why she was let go from the show. But a little bit more about Kess, the uh, Okampa. She's, or Okampa, is that what it, Luna? Luna, the intern, everybody. Okampa. So she had possessed this, like, telepathic abilities, and she was running through the motions with Tuvok, who's the Vulcan on on board Voyager, and, and kind of learning to control that. And they kind of explored it a lot and kind of, kind of was a different Star Trek kind of way, but really interesting. And then she was romantically involved with Neelix, who's played by the wonderful Ethan Phillips initially before breaking off the engagement in, uh, or not engagement, I say entanglement is a better word for it. They weren't engaged, but entanglement in season three, which just completely sidebar. If you're a Voyager fan, you know what I'm talking about. So in that episode that she breaks up with Neelix, it's the same episode that she gets like possessed by this like conscious person of this old planet's tyrant. And so I'm like, who's breaking up? Is it the tyrant? Is it Kess? Because it seemed like the tyrant broke up with her. And I was just broke up with him. So I was very, always been confused about that. Maybe it's a plot hole. Maybe I'm just not paying attention. But I, I feel like, and from hearing interviews with producers throughout the years, it seems like Kess's early development was really bogged down by her relationship with Neelix. And after they kind of broke up, they both pursued these independent character arts, which was very interesting. Neelix kind of wanted to do more security detail and just kind of explored his value on the ship and was very relatable and was very good. Probably some of the best Neelix that we will see on the show ever. And then on the flip side, we see with um, Kess never kind of made that development, you know, because we, we had some chances they could have done that even a potential, you know, dark villain angle that they could have went down that road with her, but it just didn't come to fruition. And uh, to me, she always kind of reminded me of Will Wheaton on TNG. You know, she, she was very talented. She was very young member of the cast. I think she was only maybe 18 or 19 when she was cast. So she was very young compared to the other, uh, older members, but it it just seems like the fans didn't really react quite the same way as they really didn't like (laughs) Wesley Crusher at the beginning of TNG. So she came off almost a little bit in a, uh, ahead, I think in the fans when you compare the two, but um, definitely wasn't the most popular of the Voyager crew. However, in season four, legendarily, we talk about the introduction of Jerry Ryan, seven of nine. And that meant, according to the budget, that one cast member had to go. And that has come out that it was really going to be Harry Kim, who's played by the, again, wonderful Garrett Wang, and he was going to be on the chop. But it actually proved to be Leon. Jennifer Lynn's exit came in season four, episode titled The Gift. And that's an episode which is really good because you start bringing in the Borg in season four more. And we see Kess's psychic abilities kind of spiral out of control and She's just kind of encountering Species 8472, and she just is a threat to the ship. And it just seemed kind of lazy to me. They were just kind of like, uh, let's, uh, her psychic abilities threaten to blow up the ship. All right, get her out of there. <laughs> they just kind of, like, throw her out, which I don't know. I just I just feel like it was kind of cheap, like, because she really didn't even get to say goodbye. You know, normally in Star Trek we have that, like, somber where goodbye where everyone lines the halls and they go and they do the... Of like the head nods and they're going yeah yeah and it's like none of that so it's just it just seemed kind of just real quick and lazy and I, I didn't like that and however given how apologetically you know the writers and the producers spoke about her departure from Voyager it's no surprise that she actually was brought back in season six's episode Fury so I thought that was cool it, it was neat to kind of see them bring her back and it was kind of like no bad feelings and kind of a um, nice way to kind of wrap up her storyline. And just a refresher, if you don't remember, this is kind of like a time twisty tale. We have an older Kess. Uh, she attacks Voyager for abandoning her and then travels back in time to prevent her younger self from joining the crew. And then when the older Kess is killed in the past, her timeline has changed giving Captain Janeway and Tuvok and Deelix an opportunity to kind of peacefully send Kess home to be with her own kind. So it's kind of a nice wrap up that they really didn't do when she left in season four. And it's just, they, they mishandled the character. Fury didn't 
offer Kess and Jennifer Lynn as an actress any measure of redemption in the long term. It was just kind of a, here you go. We love you. Bye. And so I think I, it. there's no real plot points. There's no real, it, it's just kind of a, almost they felt bad. So they just threw her a bone. And, and I, I just think that's kind of mean and, and, and wrong in a way. But either way, that's my personal opinion. And I'm sure, you know, maybe the producers and, and people have more uh, to say, you know, when we, once we get that Voyager documentary in a couple of years or hopefully freaking in 2024, I, I signed up to like, sponsor that thing i don't know if you guys did way back in like like was it 2022 i feel like and i still haven't i mean i still haven't gotten anything so i haven't heard anything so i think it's still being edited but hopefully we'll get we'll get that soon i I hope they definitely talk about this i imagine they would now that we've kind of talked about her arc on voyager just kind of a recap if you've never done that before we're going to talk about how actually lynn came on to voyager and like I mentioned, she was very young coming into the show, so she didn't really have a lot of uh, acting experience. But I was really shocked to find out that she was actually had kind of a rough childhood, that she grew up on the south side of Chicago. She said in a 1992 interview she was very uncomfortable living where she lived. And she's like, if you didn't fit in, you got your ass kicked. And I was my own person, and I had to de- develop this really tough skin and I had to survive and that's what we had to do. And she's like, I saw a lot of my friends fall into drugs and I've seen a lot of them die. That's intense. That is a very intense childhood. So she found reprieve and she found safety in the world of acting and it offered her a way out. She joined the Illinois Theater Center at 13 and with three years acting, she landed her first TV role in a soap opera called Another World, which you got to admit is pretty freaking crazy. You know, you do it for three years and now you're on TV, like hats off to her. That's like, so she has a remarkable potential there. And she even was, um, after Another World, she went into a more TV series called Phenom and she done a lot of voice acting roles, including Lion King 2. And then she did some on an Adam Sandler comedy record and, all before she landed her big breakout role as Kess on Star Trek Voyager. And at the time that she auditioned, she was 19 years old, and she was actually one of the very first cast members hired for the series, as well as the youngest. The producers kind of felt that Lynn was this kind of like fragile, childlike quality, and they felt that Kess needed that. I mean, uh, Kess, you know, was living under the ground in Ocampa and being taken care of this giant space snowflake. If you've never watched Voyager, you're going to think I'm high on drugs, but no. (laughs) It's just kind of, she, it fit perfectly. And you can definitely tell that she owned the role in the first uh, three or four seasons that she was on Voyager. And producer Jerry Taylor praised Lynn, said that she had an, I have to say this right, an elfin quality which informed, you know, the hair of the choice of the hair, the makeup and costume. And when I heard that quote and I was watching season three wrap up, I was like, oh, my God, they kind of did make her an elf, like with the ears and and just kind of the demeanor and it's all over the place. Um, At first, when she was on Voyager, everything seemed to go swimmingly. Uh, Leanne remarked in 1995 interview that she it was so freeing for an actress to play Cass and um, there's always something new to react to, to feel, to experience. So she she was definitely getting a lot of fulfillment out of her role, which is freaking fantastic. And she even proudly described herself in that same interview as one of those rare people who loves what they do and can actually make a living doing it. So, I mean, despite all of her youth and inexperience, she just excelled in this cutthroat, industry that is Hollywood that is acting and she excelled beautifully and even her co-stars recall her being professional and well prepared on the set in the show's early days Uh, Ethan Phillips again who plays Neelix described her as just absolutely extraordinarily easy to work with while Robert Duncan McNeil who plays the famous Tom Paris remarked that he got a sense from Jennifer that really deep down she wanted to be a very serious actress that she had a craft and that she took her job very serious now some critics and fans had issue with the character of Cass as well as Lean's performance 
with some finding, you know, maybe her too slight, maybe her too ineffectual, but there was never a backlash great enough for the showrunners to kind of feel pressure to remove the character. Leanne, on the other hand, felt a lot of pressure from the beginning, as one can imagine, and I would definitely be the exact same way. So while Voyager was this major production and big career break for pretty much everyone involved, there was always kind of this trouble behind the scenes on the Voyager sets. And if you've never heard of any of it, please check out our drama in the Delta Quadrant episode where we kind of we break this down further. Robert Beltran, the dude who plays Chakotay, tried to get fired. And <laughs> there was all this drama with Jerry Ryan and Kay Mulgrew. And it's just, you know, it's legendary. But there, there was a lot of tension between the cast and the producers. And even Garrett Wang, you know, who liked who, like Lynn, was kind of on the chopping block after season three, had admitted how close he came to losing his job. He even says in this interview that he learned the important lesson of being punctual, that, you know, several times he was tardy to work and he was met with great resistance from the producers. And during the third season, they actually threatened to fire him if he didn't get his act together. So he had a little trouble as well, kind of adjusting to brutal schedule of syndicated television the only difference in the saving grace of wang is that he got a huge career boost when he was unexpectedly listed among people's magazine's 50 most beautiful people in the world in 1997 so if that article in people never came out garrett wang would have been cut from star trek voyager and it, it was they definitely wrote it that way like you can see he has this disease from species 8472 uh, is that right luna okay uh, he has this disease he's on his deathbed he's kind of fluctuating between consciousness and not and you could i was like oh he definitely could have just died and that would have been the end of it however he gets his butt saved and with budgets you know we're going to get into this between why lynn was fired it just seemed like she also was having problems as well. According to Stephen Edward Poe in his book, Voyager History, A Vision for the Future, he said that Lynn kind of had this overwhelming pressure from all this immediate attention that came with Star Trek, especially at such a young age. He says that Lynn's responses to questions on the set or asked by producers were very monosymbolic how can you even say that luna mono symbolic so she just talked monotone the whole time is that what it means why not say that dude so she just talked monotone all the time she was very vague in her answers she never really remotely talked about herself to the crew or to the to the rest of the cast she it just seemed like she clearly wanted to disappear until it was all over and even again we see uh, in another star trek voyager celebration book written by a guy named Robinson and another guy's last name is Wright. Robert Duncan McNeil admits, you know, Lynn wasn't always an enigma. She wouldn't talk about herself. Um, Though he and other actors got the impression that she had a very difficult family life, which from her interview in 1995 definitely proves that. She had a rough go of things. And Ethan Phillips says that he always sensed there was deep waters in Lynn. We know that Garrett Wang was saved by the People article. Now, there's two schools of thought as we move into why she was let go from Voyager. And I didn't know this other side. So I always thought, and I'm sure you do, you know, the first theory is that they they just had a sex up Voyager with Seven of Nine. They introduced a new character at the end of season three this female in Borg recovery mode named Seven of Nine and to save ratings and boost viewers they bring her on with her skin tight suit that she could barely breathe in and that this was the real reason that the showrunners brought her on and that they they they're like oh it's strictly a budget uh, thing and that we had to get rid of her because you know well it's one or the other and Kess isn't sexy so she's gotta go And that's one. And that's kind of what I always believed too. You know, I'm like, oh, that sucks. That's show business. However, there's this whole other theory and this whole other terrible thing that I had no idea about. So 
apparently and allegedly, I want to say that because I don't know the truth and I don't think anybody's wanting to come out and say it, is that Lynn was also having mental health and substance issues. So Lynn herself has recalled her dismissal from the show as sudden and perfunctory. She says that I was on for a few seasons, then they asked me to leave. They decided not to renew my contract. I didn't ask why it was not being renewed. I just said, okay, and just moved on. You know, the actress insisted at the time there was no hard feelings and that she had nothing but good times on the series. And then for years, the official explanation of Lynn's departure from Voyager was that it was an entirely creative decision and that the character of Kess has kind of run her course and that there was this budget reason, so it just was a perfect excuse to kind of like get rid of this baggage, I feel like, because even showrunners Rick Berman and Jerry Taylors have admitted, you know, in interviews that the net Kess and Neelix romance angles was ill judged and despite their best efforts, it just kind of reached a creative dead end. You know, with her, and then plus you have this unique biology as an Okapa, so she's going to have this nine year lifespan. So there's very limited possibilities with her character. And so, I mean, it'd been by season six or seven, she would have been like almost, and she'd been super old, geriatric. She would have been a very old woman. So you can't really do a lot of crazy stuff with that. So, however, there's this whole new theory that's emerged and that is that she's been had, was struggling with issues that were impeding her work and that and again that celebration of Voyager book they say by the end of Lean's time on the show you know she had personal and presumed addiction issues that started to affect her reliability that she couldn't remember her lines that she would not show up on time and remember punctuality was important like I said with Wang a couple uh, minutes ago, he said that he was almost fired in season three because he kept showing up work too late. Now you have Jennifer showing up late, not on time. She's not remembering her lines. She's apparently being difficult to work with. She's not explaining to anybody that there was something going on and that when series producer Jerry Taylor reached out to her, said, what's going on and she wouldn't talk to uh, anybody and wouldn't talk to anybody on the cast and we tried to offer her help and she didn't want anything and it was just you know whatever so could this be a real reason are the showrunners kind of making mountains out of mole molehills here and with all these alleged accusations about her conduct and i think when the voyager documentary gets revealed we'll hopefully get an answer i don't know i i think that my theory is is that it's probably more of the first reason or a little of the second. So it's mainly they wanted to sex up Voyager and they're making mountains out of molehills. Remember, they needed someone to be that sex appeal and to boost ratings. And also think about this logically. Put your Vulcan ears on here. It was going to be Garrett Wang, right? Why would they, if she was really struggling with showing up on time, forgetting her lines, possible uh, substance issues, possible addictions, then why would they first have Garrett Wang, Harry Kim, the beloved ensign, on the chopping block? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make a hill of beans in any way, shape, or form, no matter how you phrase it, my friends. So if she was really having these issues, she would have been on the chopping block from the get-go. They would have said, look, she's she's being difficult. We can't work with her. Blah, 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 blah. Boom. We're going to cut her. We're going to let her go. It, remember, if it wasn't for this lame people article in 1997, the 50 most beautiful people in the world, Garrett Wang would not have been on Star Trek anymore. He would have died from that Species 8472 random disease. So to me, I think it's bullcrap. I think they're covering their tracks because now it looks super sexist. It looks super monogenistic to say, yeah, we need somebody with big boobs and a tight suit to boost our ratings. And then even look at the first couple episodes of season four. They kind of force Seven and Garrett Wang into working together in close quarters. And then uh, Seven offers to explore her sexuality with Garrett in the mess hall and so it's just like that proves to me they're just being completely shameless here 
and probably making mountains out of molehills when it comes to Jennifer Lean and or Lynn and, and they're just trying to cover their cover their butts and I think that's sad again I have no way to confirm or deny this, this is all alleged but to, to me I think it's just if you look at the what was produced you look at the actions of the showrunners and the producers it's a big old pile of bullcrap so you may ask how did the Voyager cast respond Lynn's firing affected many of her cast members and rightfully so they're very close it's a big family and Kate Mulgrew who played uh, Captain Janeway on the show told Star Trek magazine I'm very very sorry to see Jennifer go she was a part of the family I'm sorry to see the way her go the way she went you know she's a wonderful actress and that was very tough very difficult as we all know uh, Mulgrew had a notoriously unpleasant relationship with actress Jerry Ryan and could that have been because of how Jennifer Lynn was treated. You know, the elder actress apparently was very cold towards Jerry Ryan, was very often cruel towards her new co-star. Could it have been bitterness over Lynn's dismissal that seemed, you know, to, to play a part in Mulgrew's resentment of Ryan? Who knows? Now, don't get me wrong, Ryan and Mulgrew have made peace. They're, they're buddy buddies now, no big deal. Now we get into the unfortunate turn of life after Voyager for Jennifer Lynn. Initially, it looked like Lynn was going places post-Voyager. She landed a small but prominent role in the very highly talked about movie American History X. She played the sister of Edward Norton and Edward Furlong. And in the same year, she was uh, in, a, in a kind of punk indie comedy called, well, punk, SL, SLC Punk, who... She played uh, roles beside Matthew Lillard and Jason Seagal. Or Jason Siegel. That's it. Not Seagal. That's that fat karate guy. Besides these roles, her career kind of failed to gain momentum. She continued to do voice acting work, mainly in the Men in Black animated series. And after one more film role in the 2001 comedy Rubbernecking, a.k.a. Accidents Don't Happen, that's the whole title, yes, uh, she stopped acting entirely in 20, 2002, and uh, she just became a mother. So five short years after her final episode premiered in season four, she was completely done with acting. Crazy. So from 1997 to 2002, she was done. Um, in a 2010 interview, uh, Lynn indicated that her post-acting life was going fine, that everything worked out the way it should have, that everything happens for a reason, so she doesn't look back and say it should have been like this or it should have been like that, that she's perfectly at peace and content with her life, and that she doesn't live in the past and she doesn't wish anything was different. Sadly, it it seems like this peaceful life of hers didn't last, and um, again, having put acting behind her completely in 2002, she just turned to caring for her children and being a great mom, and um, she was even thinking about becoming a healthcare professional, later on in her life and going to school for that, which would have been a very gracious and, and noble way to retire from the public eye. But within a few years, she kind of returned to the spotlight, but for more unpleasant circumstances. You know, through the more recent year, she's had an unfortunate array of run-ins with the police. In 2012, she was charged with evading arrest, resisting arrest, aggravated assault, and and then in 2015, she once again faced criminal charges when she reportedly rammed her vehicle into a police cruiser. And then again in 2015, which was not a good year, she was uh, got into this argument with her neighbor in eastern Tennessee and, and was accused of exposing herself to unclothed in front of the neighbor's children, and which you know eventually led to uh, officers coming out and getting misdemeanors for indecent exposure. And she was actually order to uh, attend a psychological evaluation at a mental health institute in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So it, I, I, this incident is very controversial because you can read, and this is a news story, so you can read the police and, and what they say, and, and you can read what the neighbor says, and you can see what Jennifer Lynn says. And, and to me, I think I kind of go with Jennifer. Like she, she was in a towel, but she was arguing with her neighbor, and she was heated argument, you know, uh, grip slips and you know boob pops out or something like that <laughs> and 
the neighbor's kids were just in the yard and it, it was completely an accident and, and I don't think she was like when I hear indecent exposure I, I just think of a dude in a trench coat like you know flashing his wiener at people walking by a, I don't think this was malignant or, or um, purposeful in any single way after after reading all the police reports and stuff but still um, yeah it just doesn't stop there unfortunately so in, in 2018 she was arrested twice in quick succession for um, driving on a revoked license and then well it was revoked because she was driving on a DUI she got a DUI however since her last arrest in 2018 she has not made the news again she has not made any public statements or appearances to me it's just kind of I hope that this famed actress has found peace at last and is being cool being a mom living her best life and I for one hope that she has found the peace and quiet that she wants and I, I just want to say, you know, don't don't judge someone on their weakest moments. We've all made poor decisions and regrets throughout our lives. And I can speak for me and the whole team at OPP that we wish Jennifer the best and that she's doing great and want nothing more for her than have a rip-roaring return to Star Trek. And you say, well, how can she have a return to Star Trek, Jonathan? I say put her in Prodigy. She has a, a host of voice acting credentials and I think it'd be a match made in heaven. It would kind of reunite Mulgrew and Lynn again. And it would be pretty neat to have her kind of come back into the fold. And uh, plus then from there, you know, we could get her in reunions and, and conventions and cruise ships and all that. And I, I really do hope that the Voyager documentary goes into this and gives us an update on her and uh, her life and, and deep diving into the subject. Like I said, at the beginning of this episode, the, the team and I debated and we, and we tried reaching out to maybe get something, but we didn't want to push too hard. You know, if somebody wants to have their privacy, I think we should respect that. And I am all about that. And I definitely don't want to cross a line at any point. And I will always put people's privacy and well-being above the show and anything we produce. So there's my little tidbit. But I hope that this answers your questions and you finally have the resolution of where in the world is Kest or Jennifer Lynn. So thank you so much for listening. And Luna, let's wrap it up. Wowie, wow, wow. That was, that was an episode. Uh, that was a lot of research went into that digging through old interviews um news reports police reports things like that but um again that's kind of why it took a little bit longer we don't usually do that kind of investigation in uh our opp episodes but congrats to the whole team for putting that together and I, i'll just say again and if you know jennifer i would love to to talk to her and maybe have her on the show and she get her side of the story i don't normally do interviews but i make an exception for uh for her and I will say, boy, I'm I'm really excited. There's a lot of crazy news that's coming out of the Star Trek world that, you know, Picard potentially has a script uh, for the movie, which is nuts. To We might get a Picard movie, which after season three seems kind of foolhardy, but we'll debate that maybe on another day. Anyway, please check us out on social media. We're on Instagram twitter and facebook our instagram is our main hub we have over fifty thousand followers so feel free to communicate and reach out i love talking with you guys about a host of things especially this episode let me know what you guys think and if you're looking for some great content if you're looking for things what's the best 2023 uh, movies and shows well look no further than www.jasontalksmovies.wordpress.com he has all of all of that and more um, I loved his Godzilla one review. I still need to go see that movie. It looks phenomenal. And, and reading his non-spoiler review made me be like, I confirmed I need to see this. I'm a, my wife and I are big Godzilla fans. So yeah, we definitely got to uh, run with that. So anyway, I hope everyone's doing well. You survived the holidays. We're getting through it. Uh, just remember, keep your mental health in check. Take care of yourselves and take care of your loved ones. And we love to have you guys here. And as always... Second start of the right, straight on till morning. <laughs>